Hey, you know. Welcome so, everybody. Great to have you all here. So, uh, this year it's uh, custom cars, and as you know, custom cars are absolutely coming into their own now. Uh, everything in the hobby has hills and valleys, and uh, the custom cars were so strong in the 1950s when it really got started, and it was such a unique part of our hobby in those days. And the customizers really did a lot of work, and, and some of those cars are still around today that were done. And they were so well done that they're still in great shape. It's, it's really amazing. But the, as I said, being peaks and valleys, the custom cars are really coming back very, very strong now. And there's a lot of collectors out there just looking for the custom cars because they were so unique. And everybody can have a, a normal everyday 57 Chevy that uh, everybody else has, but as far as the custom cars are concerned, the hobby is just very, very strong right now with custom cars. Dallas, uh, Dallas Starter, multi-award winning designer from Oklahoma, National Rod and Custom Car Hall of Fame Museum. Carol? Our second panelist is John D'Agostino creator of the widely publicized custom 59 Cadillac Eldorado Seville Convertible, the Elvis Presley Tribute. John? Your palace is Bo Huff, legendary custom car builder from Utah, famous for his unique styling and hosting various national custom car shows. And our fourth panelist is my cousin Chuck Miller. At least uh, we're both Miller, so we were cousins somewhere along the line, you know. But uh, Chuck's uh, well-known customizer for Motor City and Riddler award-winning uh, designer. Chuck? <laughs> Joe Bortz. Uh, and I like this, Joe. Automotive archaeologist. Oh, you're, uh, you're into custom cars as well now. If you could just maybe give me a brief couple of minute history of uh, how you really got started in the hobby and uh, what, what brought you into the custom car world. Actually, I started my shop called, called the Star Custom Shop, put it back in 1954. I've actually built a couple hundred custom cars over the years, been featured in numerous magazines throughout the world. And uh, today I do have the National Rod and Custom Hall of Fame Museum, which you were saying that custom cars are coming back again. It's full of the old time custom cars, and it's located right outside of Tulsa. So. And I'm still actively building the cars. What ideas did you come up with? Bill, I was brought up in. Wichita, Kansas, which is, of course, the air captain back during the war, and uh, Boeing was there, Cessna, Beach, all aircraft. Of course, I was going to be an aeronautical engineer. Of course, that's what my father wanted me to be. I dropped out of college after about three years and began building custom cars, much to his dismay, to say the least, <laughs> because nobody heard of custom cars in those days. But I guess the aircraft uh, background and being around the airplanes and futuristic designs of aerodynamic designs kind of influenced my early bubble top cars. I'm known as the bubble top king. Uh, it's kind of the handle that's been stuck on me over the years because I did my first bubble top in 1959 on a car called the Predicta. And of course it was, you know, featured throughout all the magazines. So, and of course, you know, I had a lot of influence from, from the Greeks in the business like Paris and Bayon and so forth. So. Uh, it was, it was a great start and a great timing for, for all of us, actually, back in the early 50s. John, give us a little brief history about yourself. Well, it, it actually started out when I was about seven or eight years old. I was uh, born in Pittsburgh, California, which was a hotbed for custom cars. And back then, you could see cars built by Barris, Winfield, Bayon, Starver, cruising the streets of Pittsburgh. So uh, most of the Italian fellows there, Maffetano, Zocchi, Sinos, the Brillos, they all have these beautiful custom cars. So they used to go by my father's house and I used to see them and I knew one day I had to have one. So right after that I started building model cars and customizing them, chopping the tops, painting them fancy custom colors. And then my dad took me to the Oakland Rosa show in 1959 and that really sparked my interest. And I knew when I was 16 years old that, that, I, that I'd have a custom. So uh, I just opened up a shop in Milan, Celebrity Customs. I have the shop is open in California called Celebrity Customs in Discovery Bay. So I'm teamed up with the two Italian fellows there, the biggest car collectors of custom cars in the whole country. Bo oh, Huff, you're next, buddy. Had a shop in Cypress, California. Moved back to Arkansas, had a shop in Fedville, and then I moved back to Utah. I've been there since uh, 1980, building custom cars. To be in California during the, well, the 
the metal flake days and that, and I would do a lot of panel paint jobs, flame scallops, you know, blend jobs. Uh, yeah, California is definitely the hot spot of the whole thing. There in Utah, I live in a little town of 1,800 people, and there's probably over, besides, I own like 300 cars, but around probably 75 customs and hot rods in that town, out of 1,800 people. So per capita, that's a lot of interest in that little area. Well, actually, even in the 50s, uh, there was a, Utah is a hot spot for custom cars. There, no one, the magazines never went there to show them, but they're there. Custom cars are probably much more recognized by the hobby or by the, the person that's not in the hobby than the people that are in the hobby. Uh, just for the glitz and the glamour and everything that came along with the custom car world, everybody appreciates beauty and, and art, artistry, uh, artistry uh, from the, the custom car world. It takes a, an artistic uh, person to be able to do the kind of work that these guys have done. Well, I'm Chuck Miller, and I'm uh, from New Boston, Michigan. That's just a little southwest of Detroit. Uh, I started out just building model cars, you know, in grade school and high school, and working in a body shop after school. And uh, when I was 20, I opened my first shop, Skyline Custom. I started out by just doing anything, anything that anybody would let me do. You know, if I had a dent and fender or a scratch, I'd fix it for them. Because, you know, you want to do that work. That's what I always wanted to do all my life. And uh, and I felt that I could do a little bit more, you know, on each one. You know, I'd talk somebody into doing a, a flame job or a scoop or filling door handles. That's what I started out doing. Then I built the fire truck in 68, won the Riddler Award in Detroit, Cobo Hall out of Rama with that. So that's what really, I think, put the good shot in the arm there was to, you know, win that award. And then uh, my wife one day was saying uh, she wanted to put together a scrapbook of all my pictures and magazine articles and all that stuff. So uh, there was just too many. So I figured, well, instead of just cutting up a bunch of pictures and magazines, let's write a book. So I wrote a book. And all the cars over 50 years of building customs and show cars and hot rods are in the book. I have the same enthusiasm as the panelists here, but I don't have the talent. And I think what happens when you don't have the great artistic talent and the technical talent, the best thing you can do is become a collector. What advice would you give somebody that was looking to enter the custom car field today? Do your own thing, do it right, and uh, you're going to have to be determined because it's a super tough job and position to get started into, especially today. But uh, it can. Can you share with us a little about the custom car culture overseas? Actually, I started showing in 1995. That was my first European car show. It was custom motor show in Sweden, and since then I've been there what 16 years. I've only missed one year, which was 2001. But. I would say uh, the trends over there, when I started back in 95, I went to the show, there was a lot of classic American cars there, but not a lot of customs. You'd see eight or 10 customs in the show in Sweden. But now you go there today, you'll see 70, 80, 90 customs there, uh, plus a lot of American classics. The trends there, they're actually, uh, it's a mix between East and West. Uh, you know, the East Coast, they do things a little more wilder, a little more body work, uh, styling. Uh, more or less on the West Coast, a little more mild styling, you know, even though they chopped and everything. But uh, I would give it a mix of, uh, of, of a high style, radical, and with a little modifications when it comes to mild customs. Uh, I've probably been in 15 or 20 European shows. Uh, I just got back from Australia last month. Uh, there was uh, the Maryland car was actually I was uh, I was actually representing that car, the 53 Cab. But at that show, there wasn't a lot of customs in Australia. Probably probably at the show there was 10 or 12 customs. But they plan next year to have the biggest custom car cavalcade in history. They're going to have 50 custom cars. They're going to hand pick up from all around the world. Uh, they supposedly going to bring in probably uh, three or four Hall of Famers. Uh, it looks like I'll be going and probably George Barris has talked about it and hopefully we got Bo here, we got uh, Chuck, we have Daryl Starber. So we're going to try to get four or five of the uh, Hall of Famers to actually show up in Australia. But I also have done shows in, um, in, in Belgium, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria. Uh, I would probably have to say the custom car scene is more popular in Scandinavia, especially Sweden. In addition to being a well-known designer, you're a regular host of various national custom car shows and a great promoter of the custom culture lifestyle. 
The custom cars are on the rise again. They they went they went through the rat rod scene and it was a fun scene and it's still going on. But the customs, uh, at least on the West Coast, are really popping out again. Where I'm at, we listen to rockabilly music. Uh, we live a whole lifestyle of. Uh, I guess it's a rockabilly lifestyle. They, the clothing, the pinup girls, the magazines, the photographers, the car clubs, and of course the cars and the car shows. It's, it all leads where we dress the way they used to dress. Everything is the way the cars are. I'm not faking the funk. I really, really uh, enjoy what I'm doing and I believe that my children are this way, my grandchildren. Pompadours, uh, Levi's cuffed with uh, engineer boots or Converse. <laughs> yeah, living the life. Where did you get your ideas? What was the inspiration? Maybe agreement night. <laughs> I'll get customers that come to me and want to build a car. And they'll have their idea, and you put it together with them. Joe, as mentioned earlier, you're uh, now focusing on customs. Focusing on customs for part of your uh, collections. Uh, tell us what it's kind of uh, thin air at the top, uh, looking for more concept cars. And I thought, what kind of has the aspects of the Detroit show cars? And uh, I started to uh, look at custom cars. I realized that the historic custom cars interest me the most. I think you get history, you get great design, you get great execution. So you learn a little about history and you, you learn a little about the people who made the car. You know, when you see your Rembrandt or Van Gogh, I mean, everybody universally says that's great. And the cars that uh, are here and these gentlemen sitting beside me, these are, these are the, the artists that will go down the history books for centuries. So I think when you can get cars that have some history to them, some documentation, I agree with you that the focus is, does seem to be coming very strongly on these cars and uh, I think it will continue. And the only thing that will change on that is the prices will go up uh, as we're starting to see right now. Uh, how about a big round of applause for our third panelists?